Welcome to our professional learning session today. My name is Katie and with us we have Shona and we're from the education team at Geoscience Australia. Today's session will be learning resources for teaching middle primary earth science. So that's stage two, year three and four. We'd like to first do an acknowledgement of country. We would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of all the lands on which we virtually meet today and pay our respects to elders past and present. We'd also like to extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining in for this session. Geoscience Australia is Australia's national geological survey and we provide geological and geographical information for the nation. The education team at Geoscience Australia has a number of functions. First and foremost, education delivery. Up until recently, that was physical visits to our education centre at Geoscience, in Geoscience Australia in Canberra. So we would run curriculum aligned visits for students in years four to senior school to our centre. Unfortunately, due to COVID in 2020, there were uh, hardly any visits um, and we focused more on educational resource development. So for the past year, we've been developing resources such as uh, videos, which talk a lot about what students might see if they visited our centre. We've also been producing online activities for students. And all of these things can be downloaded for free from our website. We also do teacher professional development, like we're doing now, mostly on site, but we're doing more online virtual sessions and education outreach. So what are the big ideas in earth science? When you say the words earth science, what topics should you be thinking about? The first one is the age of the earth and geological time. Now these are really, really big concepts and really difficult for young students to understand. Today we'll talk a little bit about the age of the earth and geological time and how you might be able to introduce this to year three or four students. The second big idea is the rock cycle. And there's a diagram on this slide which demonstrates a very simple rock cycle process. And this is something that we'll also be talking about today. The third big idea in earth science is plate tectonics. Now plate tectonics is not something that would need to be talked about um, for year three, four students. It might come up in year five and six when students in science are studying natural hazards, but the focus of year nine science is plate tectonics. So when we're looking at year three, four earth and space science and the Australian curriculum content description, the earth's surface changes over time as a result of natural processes and human activity. Now, the thing we wanna focus on when we're talking about this topic with students is that these are slow changes that happen over long periods of time. And we'll show you some activities today that you'll be able to use with students that represent these slow changes. So when we're looking at this topic, you might start by thinking about some landscapes and some amazing landforms that students might have seen. Maybe not in real life if they live in a city, maybe on videos, maybe in photographs. Australia has some amazing landscapes that can be looked at through photographs or videos. So you might think about the diversity of landscapes. You might ask your students to look at these images and try and excite in them the wonder and awe that is the Australian continent. So I've just got a few slides here with some photographs that show the variety of things um, and landscapes that you can see just across Australia. You could find images like this online or you could use things like Australian Geographic um, web resources or even magazines to show students all of these different landscapes. So what shapes the landscapes? What natural processes 
cause these varying landscapes across the Australian continent. So main things, tectonic forces, vaulting, vaulting, uplift, earthquakes, volcanoes, mass movements and landslides. Those are all things that you wouldn't talk about in this topic because they're related to natural hazards that you would potentially teach in year six. Sea level changes um, is a really important thing that shapes the landscape. Um, we're not going to mention that today any further. Weathering erosion and deposition and rock types are very big shapers of the landscape and those are the topics we're going to cover today. And again, any of these discussions can be enhanced through the use of imagery. Uh, picture speaks a thousand words. Show students images, get them excited about what they're going to be talking about. So when we're teaching students in year three or four about um, earth surface changes over time, the first thing that we do is ask them to think about, well, how old is the earth? How long has the earth been around for these things to change? And we have a diagram up here of the geological time scale. Um, the earth is 4,600 million years old or 4.6 billion years old. That's a really, really long time. And again, that's a really hard concept for students to understand. So when we're talking about this, we're not just talking about, oh, back when my grandparents were around or back when the Egyptian pyramids were around, not even back when the dinosaurs were around. We're talking billions of years ago. And so we try and get them to think about what things might have changed during this 4.6 billion years. What things might have changed or stayed the same? And we often do this using flip cards rather than just saying to students, think of some things that have changed. Um, because this is such a big concept, they're often really constricted to um, people and animals, but we want them to think over that 4.6 billion years, what might have changed. So things like life forms, definitely. Things like dinosaurs back 65 million years ago, but also the temperature of the earth, the sea level, position of the continents, and in relation to that, the shape of the oceans, and oxygen concentrate, concentration. And all of these things are very slow changes to the surface of the earth. And weathering and erosion, some are, these are terms that are gonna come up again and again, are the processes that are significant shapers of the landscapes we see today. So if we're thinking about the things that have changed and these natural processes, these changes have created many different landforms and these are particularly can be related to rock types. So if we're looking at some images, again, we really love the use of images. We might think about sandstone cliffs. We might think about granite tours. We might think about limestone caves. So the environment and resultant landforms in that environment can be directly related to weathering and erosion of those rock types that are in that environment. So what do these words mean that I keep mentioning? Weathering, erosion and deposition. These are all things that cause slow and steady changes to the surface of the earth. Weathering is the breakup and breakdown of material at the earth's surface without that material being moved. Now in high school, students will go into more detail and learn about physical, chemical and biological weathering. And we'll mention a few of those today as well. Erosion is the movement of that solid material away from where it broke down, usually by gravity, down a slope, by water in a river, by wind or by ice. Deposition is the settling down or the dropping of that material by any means, including wind, water, ice, or other natural processes. 
I'm now going to hand over to Shona and she's going to talk through some activities that you could do with your stage two, year three, four students to demonstrate some of these weathering processes. Okay, so first of all, let's think about a physical weathering process which is really easy to understand for students at this age. Now on the diagram on the screen you can see that we've got a rock where you have water collecting in that rock. Now that could be in tiny little pore spaces or it could be in more significant cracks. But in a climate zone where that water is frozen and thawed out repeatedly, so perhaps through a winter where you have above zero temperatures in the daytime but below zero at night, then you have this water freezing and thawing repeatedly. And this freeze thaw action is strong enough over time to crack rocks open. And you can see that great big boulder with those very jagged looking cracks on it. But the reason this works is because of what happens to water when it freezes. And a way to illustrate that is using some syringes or a syringe. And in this case, the syringes have been filled up with water to a particular mark and it's colored water just to represent water and it shows up more clearly. And it's possibly easiest to fill up to maybe 10 mils of water freeze it overnight. We've got a little piece of blue tech on the end here to make sure it doesn't spill out, but freeze it overnight. And as that happens, the plunger is able to expand as the ice expands or the water expands as it freezes. And then the next morning, it's easy for students to read off a different reading. And it's roughly, well, technically it's about a 9% expansion, but if they read about 10 mils of expansion, something like that, they'll get the idea of a quite significant force and change over time. And again, they can see it repeated and repeated. So quite a little simple either demonstration or a little activity students can do for themselves. And that's an example of a physical weathering process. Another example might be just simply heating and cooling of a rock repeatedly again and again and again can cause it to start to crumble. Now, the next slide has a picture of limestone and that is a rock that is often chemically weathered. Now, for young students, this is kind of a tricky thing to show. Um, what I'm going to demonstrate is a piece of limestone, a bit like the one in the image, with some dilute hydrochloric acid going onto it. Now, if you're in a school with an adjacent high school, you might be able to borrow some dilute hydrochloric acid. I've got glasses on. I'm going to be very careful with this, but I wouldn't advise that you have students um, doing this for themselves. Now, the hydrochloric acid, dilute, is representing rain. And you can sometimes make this work with a weaker acid such as vinegar, but you might have to actually powder the rock to provide a, a greater surface area available. If I tip this down, you can hopefully see my piece of limestone here. And when I drop the acid onto it, or the rain, I can hear a fizzing sound. You might be able to see that there's a bubbling going on. And also, as time goes by, that actually etches into, is a chemical reaction with the rock, taking away some of the rock material and it flows away. And limestone is known for developing these little sort of gutters in it. They can, they're called rillenkaren. These little gutters are particular features of limestone rock. Now, some of that rock material, which is chemically removed, is then flowing perhaps underground and can end up being the material that is deposited to form stalactites and stalagmites as the cave formations within the um, underground caves. And also the cave itself is opened up by the water's reaction with the rock. So that's a couple of weathering processes. There are many more, but that's a couple of easy ones to consider. And we're going to switch now to thinking about erosion. And I'll hand back to Katie to introduce this. Excellent. Thank you, Shona. So I'm going to now put on a little video which is available on our web page. Um, the title being Why Are River Pebbles Round? Um, and we'll watch through this video and then we'll come back to Shona and she can talk through a little bit more about how you might run this activity with students. Okay, so I'm going to share. Hi, I'm Katie from Geoscience Australia. Have you ever wondered why river pebbles are round? Well, today we're going to find out. Here is a river pebble. Can you see that it's rounded and smooth on the outside? 
But it didn't start out like this. Thousands of years ago, this river pebble looked a bit like this. Have you ever seen a rock like this before? Do you know what it's called? You might have seen it in kitchen bench tops. This is a piece of granite. Granite is an igneous rock that formed deep underground. But how did it get to the surface? Over time, the Earth's surface changes. The granite is pushed up and then exposed to weathering and erosion. It's hit by wind and rain. And that starts breaking it down. We can do a little experiment to show how this works. All you need is some sugar cubes, a container that seals well, and a texture. I've coloured in some of my sugar cubes so we can see what happens to them when we do our experiment. These sugar cubes are going to represent this rock and this container is going to represent our river. So imagine that piece of granite has come to the surface of the earth, it's been broken off a big boulder and fallen into a creek or a river. We're going to put these sugar cubes into the creek or river. Now once it goes in the creek or river, that water is flowing along, moving that piece of granite. So I'm going to give this a big shake to represent that piece of rock tumbling around in the water. Now the more you shake it, the more weathering and erosion you're exposing that piece of rock to. Now let's have a think about what might have happened to that piece of rock. Let's make a hypothesis. That's a guess about what you think might have happened. You might like to write down or draw what you think will have changed on that sugar cube. Once you've done that, let's open up the environment, the river, and have a little look at what's happened. If we look inside the container, we can see those pieces of sugar that I coloured in, and we can see that they've changed shape. If we look at them closely, can you see that they've become smaller and more rounded? The corners have been broken off and the edges have been broken off. If we look at one that's been in here even longer, you can see it's become even smaller and more rounded, more spherical. But what about those pieces that have broken off the sugar cube? They're in the bottom of the container. In this case, they're sugar crystals. But in the environment, we would call that sediment little pieces of rock that have broken down off a larger rock that can be moved or transported by wind or rain. Let's have a look at what happens to granite. When granite breaks down or is weathered, this is what it starts to look like. And you might recognise this from your back garden. Granite is a very common rock in Australia. And all those pieces that have broken off the granite become sediments those little particles of material that can be transported by wind and rain. Now this is an activity that you can do at home. You might want to try it using different variables and testing different hypotheses. If you go to the Geoscience Australia website and the education section, you can download an activity sheet to undertake this activity. Thanks, Katie. So, as Katie mentioned in the video, there's a whole activity sheet with a lot of background information for teachers about this. But just a few tips, I have the same little container here. When you start to do this, if you just want to do it as a demonstration to start off with your students, um, rather than watching the video or doing it as a more long-winded version of things, just the activity of passing this around and getting it shaken is, is always engrossing for them. Um, watch out for those students that forget to breathe when they're shaking their container and it's always a good idea to have a few particles already in it before you add a new one as well so we've got that shaking around you know this is our container nice little sort of tupperware container sugar cubes these days they're unfortunately not a technical cube and something we could do in addition would be to literally weigh the cube as well. And you'll know which one it is, hopefully, because they, you could have some coloured marking on it. But weighing it is an extra quantification of this process that you could add into it. Now, you can choose to set your students loose on an open-ended inquiry where they decide what they're going to 
experiment with what the variables are going to be, or you could direct them much more closely. But there's a lot of potential in this activity that goes beyond just um, demonstrating an erosion activity. So um, Katie's got the slide that just shows part of the activity sheet and there's student sheets on that. And um, I've still got the, the rock, one of the pebbles that she had. And I'll just show one other rock that goes with this. If you come across a rock like this, that's made up of a whole bunch of rounded pebbles, then the further extrapolation for adults and children is, well, where did this come from? What environment was this rock from? And if it's made of rounded pebbles mixed up with sand sized grains, a mixture of grain sizes, it's likely to have been formed in a riverbed way back possibly millions and millions of years ago. Thanks Shona. So I'm going to show one more video um, uh, right now. So once you've investigated that weathering and erosion process using the sugar shake activity, you might want to talk about uh, deposition or the dropping of sediments with your students. Um, and we find students adore this activity. They adore it so much that often they're itching to get their fingers in the sand. Um, so if you are thinking about doing this as a demonstration, um, our recommendation would be let the students play with it first, or go out into the sandpit in the playground, get a hose on it and let the students explore first because they can't keep their hands off it. Um, once they've had some time to explore, you might want to set up a few different experiments, a few different demonstrations. Um, and I'm going to show you this little video now which shows how this might work. Um, so this activity is set up in an under bed storage container on a slight angle um, filled with sand. You can see different kinds of sand there, uh, a few little pebbles and then water flowing down through it. Um, so I'll show this video um, and then we can talk a little bit more about it. As you go through this experiment, you can change the conditions um, by doing things like adding pebbles in various places that might block or change the direction of flow. Or you can also try using your fingers to carve channels and see what happens with the water flow as it goes. So you can see here we've just got a tube flowing a very small amount of water into the sand which is going down through that sand. You can look at the individual grains of sand and how they move, how they're deposited down the bottom and then we've got that drain at the bottom and um, we can recycle that water through the system. So let's just go back to our PowerPoint now. Um, so as I said, this one's set up using an underbed storage tub, but if you have a playground um, with a sandpit and a hose, you could do it easily enough out in the playground. Um, we will have this activity available on our website in the coming months um, with instructions on how to set this up. Now I'm going to hand back to Shona for the last section of the professional session today, talking about um, how you might implement these getting students out into the environment. So we understand it's hard to take the students outside and particularly away from the school grounds but if it's possible earth science studies are always enhanced by getting further away out to a beach nearby out to a river anything like that. Um, there's a whole bunch of inquiries that you can then follow on from or follow into with that. If you've got a beach nearby, actually trying to create some sort of quantification studies of the changes after storms and heavy rain. You know, beaches are such a great environment for showing water flowing and moving sand without it having to be in an experimental setting. The sediments themselves can be analysed, comparing, say, a, a sample of beach sand and a sample of river sand. And you can see the types of things that can be analysed in the, in the sort of grain card that's shown on this slide. The roundness of grains, the mixture of grain sizes or the lack of mixture of grain sizes is a relevant thing. Students absolutely love magnification. So getting magnifying glasses out, getting microscopes out to look at sand 
is you know, it's not new, but they may not have looked at sand in this way. If you have a local cave area that you can visit, think about going there. Um, perhaps more so for people in urban areas, you might not have exposed rocks nearby, but you might have gravestones in a graveyard that you can look at and see if there's different rock types which seem to be more resistant to the weathering processes or more crumbled after a number of years. And then there's other things to consider, like how do you protect an environment from undue amounts of erosion? It could be that you set up some sand or soil in different crates and run water over those surfaces, but then change their surfaces, add grass, add some turf on one, have you know, some that are gullied already and see what happens. So experiment in those ways and also compare with pictures of the natural environment that's had those problems. So there's all sorts of um, links there with sustainability and critical and creative thinking. Now, the resources that we have here at Geoscience Australia are on our website. Everything's downloadable, everything's free. The video, we, the, some of the videos, uh, the main video we saw today, plus many others are available and there's going to be more to come. There's the resources, the activity sheets, they're all there for you to explore and download. So hopefully you'll find your way to that in the near future. There are particular resources that are relevant to what we've been doing today. There's a booklet and it's a comprehensive booklet about weathering and erosion processes. It wasn't targeted at primary teachers, but it is a resource for you if you want to know more than your students or if you've got students that are asking those really tricky questions or if you want some information about Australian examples like the Australian coastline or like the Australian features like uh, Uluru and understanding a bit more about how they formed. There's the link here to the sugar shake activity. And we've also got an eternally popular video about Minecraft. So many students are still very into Minecraft and are learning earth science through it, but not always completely accurately. There's another resource that we thoroughly recommend for activities in the classroom, and that's called Earth Learning Idea. And each of these activities, it's uh, just describing a relatively short demonstration or participation activity, but it's supported by information on what this means. So the teacher is completely supported rather than having to figure out the scientific meaning of what they might be doing. So thoroughly recommended there as well. And then that's just about it for us today. We've talked about some really introductory but important aspects of teaching your middle primary students about the changes to the Earth's surface. There's much more to it, but I hope that this will inspire you to get out there and do a bit more. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.